<laughs> so it's like the old days, live recording. It is like the old days. <laughs> Jeez, I know. This has been unbelievable. Have, have you been busy as ever during the pandemic, Paul? Oh, yeah. You know, because I'm a tenured professor at Roosevelt University, so I've got that. But I've been doing a lot of records, just, you know, different really? people send me files. Yeah. But the last gig I actually did was in Denver on March 8th, 15th with the guitar player Fareed Hawk. That's the last oh, wow. live gig. That's the last live gig I've done. So it's been over a year now. Wow. Um, How about you, Mike? Um. I'm working on several things, but I don't have the, the setup. Like uh, I've got drums and I've got mics, but I don't have it set up to record. Mm. And, um, but I'm working on a record with Pat Gleason and Sam Morrison. Um, we did a live gig like a two years ago and it was very cool. And I took it and I edited some of it, like a serious Tio Macero thing on it. And it's pretty cool. And so he, his idea basically was Pat Gleason to do like a remake of In a Silent Way, you know? Mm. And um, and then it's gone on all these directions and then the pandemic hit. So I'm, I'm I don't know. I, I need, I can get somebody over here to, you know, get it all set up uh, or I can go into somebody's studio. I've just had my second shot. Me so too. That, We're done that, too. Yeah. Yeah. So that could make it easier. Um, but I'm really seriously looking into getting some. Um, I got to eat a, a rolling um, brain, you know, like an older mm -hmm. thing, so that I could trigger software like Superior Drummer 3. Mm. And um, so I really want to, I think I really want to get uh, either electronic drums, like ones with really good sounds, or to trigger the uh like superior drummer and those things which are just unbelievable mm -hmm. and um and be able to do more what what system do you use paul at home what's your setup well right now i mean um you know just to focus right you know and i've got like all all the the, the regular mics and stuff and just kind of going in that way do you go into a DAW? i do i mean what I've been recording on, I mean, I used to record on sonar all the time, you uh -huh. know, when I, when I was on PC, but now I'll, I'll just usually go into Pro Tools, you know. Uh huh. But I got to update my computer because the school gave me a computer and I'm maxed out, you know. I mean, like, I think I've got like two gig of uh, hard drive space on it left. Wow. So sometimes now I have to go to external hard drive. It gets pretty crazy because yeah. I just got asked literally the two days ago to go to Denmark to play with Niels Landoki. And then the next day to go to Italy to play with, actually I have three bands in Italy that just did three records that came out. I saw so that. I'm hope, hopefully that's going to happen. Hopefully it's going to be fun to play again. You know, it's going to be well, weird. It, it's not going to happen this year, man. Well, I mean, this was, this would have been, you know, they're asking me to go July and August. So we shall see, you know? Yeah. I don't I know. Don't think so. It's, I mean, Italy shut down again now. I know. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I, I was supposed to be over there as well, starting mm -hmm. in uh, Madrid and then going, this is for uh, August and that's all canceled. And because actually I've been looking to move over there too. Whereabouts? Well, um, Portugal maybe. Oof. You know, um, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why Portugal, although I love Spain and I love Italy, but, but, Portugal for other reasons like visa, citizenship, tax reasons, uh -huh. uh, paths to uh, visa, and you know. Also, I, I I really enjoy a change where I could be somewhere and within an hour get anywhere in Europe. You know. Oh yeah, yeah. There's a guitar player there, Sandro Norton, that just asked me to do something with Steve Rodby and Makoto Ozoni. Oh really? So I would love to go over there again. I mean, the food there, the wine. You know, the port. I mean, man. But yeah, yeah, you know, I talked to Pat about a month ago or maybe a little longer. And he was saying, yeah, most stuff is canceled now until 2022. Yeah. But it seems like, you know, people are still trying to see if they can do things, you know, maybe this year, outdoor festivals or something. I don't know. We yeah. shall see. But yeah, I mean, Italy is shut down again for the third time. So and, and, and a lot of Europe, too. I mean, it, and, you know, they 
Every, what happened is everybody went out too early. And, right. um, and now there's also the new English strain over there. Yeah. I talked to my friend, uh, Corrado Rustici, in, in, uh, who just moved to Berlin from, from uh, the Bay Area. And he, I know him from, he produced uh, uh, Zuccaro. And, oh, wow. Uh, okay. And so I got to play on and tour with Zuccaro. And he said, everything is... Um, the, the strain, the new strain from England is like, that's what's happening now. Mm-hmm. So even if people like had COVID, they're getting sick again from the <sighs> new strains. That's, that's exactly what, what, I mean, we got the Moderna vaccine. What did you get? Did you get the Pfizer. Moderna? Pfizer. You got the Pfizer. Okay. Yeah. Andre, your volume is low. Okay. Uh, check, check. Is that any better? You should, even louder would be better. You are talking to two drummers, remember, you know. Yeah, we, we're a little hard of hearing here, bro. <laughs> Speaking of which, did you did you see that movie, The Sound of Metal? Did I you see that? Two, two nights ago. Man, that was really, I mean, that's a heavy movie, you know. Uh, yeah, it's up for an Oscar, too. Right, and deservedly yeah. so. So is he, you know, so it's yeah. really good. We're, we're trying to go through all of the Oscar movies, you know, um, <laughs> as much as we can. After Rachel, you know? Right. Well, that's the thing we were talking about before we went on is that, you know, in the old days, we would just listen to music all day long, you know? And now it's really kind of hard to find the time to just sit down and enjoy, an, you know, an album, you yeah. know? Isn't it I mean, funny? I, I can find the time. What I need is space. I moved into a really small place mm. with, uh, with an external place where I could set up. Mm. I mean, it could be fine, but... I can't really sit with my wife and listen to miles and stuff, you know, mm. and you know, it's kind of a shame. I mean, she likes country music, you know what I mean? Uh-huh. And not that she doesn't like miles. I mean, but I'd love to be able to sit in a room with a great sound system and pull out the records and nothing else. Yeah. You know? Glass yeah. of wine and, and just be inspired by the music. Like we used to be, mm-hmm. you know. I mean, yeah, and then, uh, and then you work on something new. You try to write something and get the ideas down in your DAW, and that's what I miss, you know. DAWs, yes. Uh, you know this, uh, ladies and gentlemen. How are you? And I want to, you know, we hit the. <laughs> As a host, this has one been one of the most delightful starts because we hit the ground running. Oh yeah. Gentlemen, these dear- yeah, we were at least 300 beats per minute on that first tune, you know. <laughs> and, and folks, you know, I, I didn't interject because here it is this is improvisation, it's two brilliant drummers, it's two old friends, and it's also I wanted to just sit and, and soak up the joy and the positivity of these two gentlemen who are still excited and still want to get out there. And so we're going to come right back to this, but I got to do my job for a second and just say hello, uh, viewers of Make Weird Music and how are you tonight? Welcome to Confronting Creativity. My name is Andre Chumley and we're here at Make Weird Music. And I'm very uh, uh, delighted to introduce my guests tonight. You know, I don't even have to on one level, but but for those of you who are, are, are watching this and don't know, we have... A gentleman here who uh, people know from, you know, eight Santana records and the Woodstock movie and Stoma Yamashita's Go and his own band Automatic Man and his recent band Spellbinder and Klaus Schultz. He's done so much music around the world and still does music, which we're going to talk about. Mr. Michael Shreve. How are you? <laughs> With that introduction, man, geez, how can I ever match that level of excitement? Truth, truth. And then we just all- play loud. Just talk real loud. That's. <laughs> and again, you know, those of you watching know and, and have enjoyed uh, uh, the artistry and the amazing playing of this man. You know him for many years with the Pat Metheny group, you know, genre defining records that, that uh, we're still listening to and, and still trying to figure out what's happening. Uh, the Paul Wertico Trio, you know, uh, uh, Earwax, SBB, all these incredible groups. One of my favorite that I'm going to ask him about, The Sign of the Four, which was incredible group with, with Paul and Pat Metheny, Greg Bendian, and the one and only Derek Bailey. Another man who's been around the world with his music, Mr. Paul Wertico. How are you guys? Great. Doing great? 
<laughs> that was apparent as we, we went into it. But keep on talking. Keep on telling us. I want to ask you both a little bit. Uh, you're already talking about it, but tell us a little bit about this year because as a creative person, on the one level, you've both worked from home for many years, right? You've gotten email albums and you've done albums where people used to, you know, send tapes around. Keep reflecting a little bit on what this year and the prospect of when the heck are we going to play again? Tell us some more about that. Mike, go ahead. Well, for me, um, I decided when it looked like we were going to be locked down for a while, I decided that there's projects that have been sitting there for 20 years that are 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 worth are worth completing that they have value and i wanted to do them one of them is this book on elvin jones that i started uh, a long time ago by, by mistake um i i i told elvin you know like you should do a book you know and um and he said uh, well why don't you do it yeah. and i <laughs> and by mistake i said okay and that was you know that was so as a result, I ended up going with him, meeting him and his wife Keiko in Greece after their European tour, spent like two weeks over there every day interviewing him and, and then traveling with him to his hometown and spending a lot of time in New York and here. And so I've got these great conversations that we had and I've taped them all. I've got some on film. I've also got two nights at Jazz Alley filmed. Um, and so I am now putting it together and working with some people um, to release it. Um, Rob, Rob Wallace at Hudson Music. And, and so every day I'm working on that. I mean, I've got, I've got all the materials, but part of, the, part of the, the detail work is it's almost like excavation. I've got copies on, you know, cassettes, mini disc dats and cds and so i'm trying to sort out like what are the doubles and getting all the transcriptions but it but i realized the material i have is just unbelievable the stories are unbelievable he's talking about like going in you know when he first the first night he played with john and then going into the studio and doing my favorite things on uh, by the way which was like a 24 or 26 inch bass drum and um just all, all these great stories. So working on that and, um, and then a record that I started many years ago where I had this idea of what kind of music would I like to make that I would listen to at two in the morning. And it, it you know, I'd like to listen to chill music, like choral music. And I don't come home at night and listen, want to listen to like beats, you know. Um, because before being a drummer, I'm, I'm a fan of music, period. <laughs> and so I designed this kind of record that I'm standing up playing like 16 toms in a semicircle. And the idea was no beats, just pulse. Mm -hmm. And I did it with a synthesis and it, named Paul, named, uh, not Paul Wortico, but um, <laughs> um, Jeff Grinke. And he's a kind of a sound designer type of guy and then it sounded too new agey to me and so then i added you know i added jack d Jeanette and ayerto and zakir and i have a i have the intro by um olatunji Ooh. and i have paul um what's his name not paul Wertico. um uh pete lockett and <laughs> and trevor uh trey gunn and other mm -hmm. people skerrick and so that record, I'm finishing up the artwork for that. And I'm on Tobin as well. And um, so I'm finishing up the artwork and finalizing that. And it's coming out beautiful. It's very different. And it's 20 years old, but still, I'm not even hearing anything like it. It's, I mean, I, I, I have played it for, sent it to close friends. And like, they don't even say anything. They don't even get back to me. I, I think if they think, you know, Shreve, what, what are you doing? You know, it's like, uh, you know, <laughs> it's funny. I, I have to laugh because I love it. And it, it's not a weird record. It's just, you know, it's just like, 
I mean, you don't use Jack DeJanet or Zakir in the way that I'm using them, but they both love it. You know, I mean, Jack loves it. And so um, anyway, you know, finishing that up and then I have this project with five other drummers um, ever since ever since April, um, three times a week, I started Zooming and recording with Lenny White, Mike Clark, Greg Rico and David Garibaldi and myself. Wow. And so we were talking about like, what was it like coming up in the late sixties and the Bay area and what was the musical climate of that period, which, you know, we didn't take for granted, but in retrospect, it was really amazing. And so, um, so, you know, the, those conversations kind of turned into a lifeblood, like a little brotherhood, like a boys club too, three times a week, <laughs> you know, and we, nobody wanted to miss it. So, um, and now we've been having guests and, and doing that, you know, so like, as a matter of fact, tomorrow we have Antonio and, uh, and we've had so many, but we're so backed up with any production stuff that, um, takes forever. We've had Charlie Hunter and we've had Peter Erskine and we've had Stanley Clark and, and those things that are not even, not even edited, you know? So, but anyway, it's, um, so, so sorry, Michael, just to interject is, so that's going to see the light of day for the rest of us at some point. It, it's, uh, there's, a, there's two episodes that are out now. It's called stick people. It's called oh. on the corner with stick people. Okay, great. I'll look for Here that. You go see. Oh, that's great. Uh, okay, on the corner with stick people. So a little mild. And there, it's on YouTube. Okay. Yeah. Love it. So, yeah. yeah. So um, and so that that's been fun, and you know, and then you know, trying to learn software and stuff so that I can move forward in my life making music when my hands go. You know what I mean? <laughs> wow, what a great attitude. That's uh, you got to keep making music. Yeah. By hook or by crook, you know. <laughs> um, well, that that uh, sounds like nonstop, Michael. I love it, and I love that the that there's projects and that you're like you said, mini disc, cassette, CD, whatever format. Uh, and what a great what a great attitude, you know. Uh, and we talked right after this all started, and yeah, it's like you can make lemonade out of lemons if you if you find the way, and that's a great way to do it. You just said, hey, backlog, let, let's work on this. Um, Paul, oh, you, you do. Yeah, Paul, tell us a little bit, because I know you you were teaching before and after, and you still are. So, so talk to us a little bit about how you hit the ground running a year ago. Yeah, I, you know, for one thing, I mean, we've been, my family and I, we've been really lucky, you know, because my daughter is still able to work via, um, you know, Zoom. My wife is, and I am too. So all my classes the last, the, uh, last semester, actually starting last spring, have been remote. I haven't been in my office in like a year. So I teach, you know, cause I'm a full-time professor. So, you know, like today I was teaching my classes from home here, right, right, right where I am. So, you know, the income has been steady, which is great. Cause like I said, I'm tenured and I love teaching. I really have some great students, some really great drum students, but also just, you know, I, I came up with a lot of even classes for non-music majors, like social justice through sound, you know? Wow, really? Um, yeah. Rock music. It's ro it's role in society, which I taught today, you know, um, I taught last semester, I taught, you know, the power of black American music. So, you know, just teaching and a lot of that is teaching not just the music because, you know, some of these kids are not musicians if they're not music majors, but just talking about the cultural, social implications of everything. And so, you know, just keep on learning more and more, even even though I know a lot, I still learn so much all the time. So it's very inspiring, you know, to, to do that. And then on the playing front, you know, like I was saying earlier, I haven't done a live gig for a year, but there's been a lot of records that have come out since then. Um, I did a, a track with this great Russian guitar player, Roman Mirshnenko. And so I'm on his record, The Sixth Sense. And then he played on my wife's tune, uh, Love Can Conquer Hate. So I played percussion on it, sent the file to Moscow. He played on that, you know, so that was great. Um, I've got three records coming out from Italy, one with my trio, uh, 
a uh, great bass player, uh, Gianmarco Scalia. We have a quartet that we recorded in Udine in uh, 2019, and then a double record with the sax player from Supertramp, John Hellowell. Oh, and sure. um, uh, Romando Melalupe is the guitar player and, and John Marcos on that. And then I have a trio with a really great piano player, Fabrizio Makata, and again, John Marco. And that record's coming out. That's one of the ones we'll be touring with. And it's called Letter from Rome because we record it in Rome. It's a play on, you know, Letter from Home. Yeah. And, you know, like I was just saying, a lot of other people have contacted me to, to do tracks, but I found a bunch of old tracks too. I just found four nights with my sextet and quintet with Lyle May's guest artists sing from, uh, from 1992 and 1993 that are amazing. So I've been finding all these on different, you know, dats, cassettes, yeah. you know. Well, you know, it's so funny because not only are LPs coming back, but cassettes are back now, you know? know, waiting for the eight yeah. track to come back, you know. know. Yeah. But it's great that so far everything has been sounding really good, you know, because tapes a lot of times will disintegrate. And Howard Levy, the great harmonica player, piano player with Bella Fleck, he just released two things that I did back in the 80s with him. One of them is the NBV Quintet, No Bad Vibes Quintet, where we just went in the studio one day and it's some of the best playing I ever did. I mean, I'm listening like, I'm, what the hell am I doing? And the other thing that's really fun, you know, you were talking about earwax control. There's a band called Word of Cocaine and Gray. And it's we put out seven CDs already and a couple um, couple DVDs. It's with David Kane, great uh, sax player, keyboardist, but also a filmmaker. And then Larry Gray is somebody I've been playing with for years. Like He plays bass, cello, um, you know, guitar, drums, piano. He's like a virtuoso. He's also a professor. And so we're working on our eighth record right now. Wow. And, and everything is 100% improvised. I mean, it kind of goes with Mike's thing where we don't care what people think. If we love it, that's, I mean, because in life you go like, we know what we're doing now and we don't need to necessarily hear somebody go, well, you know, that's, you know, you're not playing bebop changes there, you know? And so it's, you know, we have to fulfill our artistic visions, especially at this particular time, because now we trust ourselves. You know, when you're younger, you know, you're kind of at, at, you know, you have people telling you, your teachers and, you know, people you want to impress, older musicians, like, oh, you know, do this, do that. And, you know, we, I think Mike and I, we, we kind of stuck to our guns, right? We just did what we were going to do anyway, but we took that new information in and utilized it to help do what we were going to do anyway, just kind of broaden our perspectives. But when you get older like this, we're still doing that. But now, you know, we don't need to necessarily, if someone doesn't like it, well, then perhaps they're, they're missing the point of what we're really honestly trying to do in our lifetimes. And I think too much music, especially nowadays, has a tendency to get homogenized. You know, it's always been a thing teaching these courses where the music industry would take over once something got popular and try to make it all sound like that until something else came along. And then that was old and now something else is new. Mike and I are playing creative music and we don't need, really need to do that anymore. You know, I, I think I think that it's, it's our responsibility to. Mm -hmm. um, to be moved by the stuff that would naturally move by mm -hmm. and, 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 and to put out into the world, the things that we personally find beautiful. Right. You know? Exactly. Exactly. And when we, when we were younger, you know, we were, we didn't start playing music to be famous or rich. We, there was just something that we needed to do to get out of us. And then, you know, over the years we've perfected, hopefully not, not perfect, but you know, we've worked on, it, getting our ideas clearer, coming up with, with stuff that we didn't know was possible, you know, 10 years before, and you grow as an artistic person. And then you get to that point where now, you know, we just need to, to be who we are, you know? And like, the, yeah. so the word of cocaine, a great thing. What's so funny is the very first time we played together, we filmed it. Dave Kane brought seven cameras. <laughs> we totally improvised this thing okay totally improvised we never had played before as a trio we played 100 percent improvised we won um the independent music award that year for best live album wow you know yeah so you know yeah, there, there's a I, thing I, called chemistry too right mike that's exactly right and and to do it improvising 
I mean, I do miss that, you know, where it's just completely, um, I, I mean, I got, I had a band, you know, and we were, I was playing every Monday night in Seattle for like seven years, but I even got tired of playing the tunes and then going through everybody's solos. And I just like, I started resenting it, you know, um, <laughs> I don't know why it was, you know, but I, I realized, um, something's happening to me and I, I got to pay attention to it. You know, I, I just, I don't like, um, I don't like everybody soloing in every tune and stuff like this. You know, I just, it's like, man, that's a formula if, if anything. And, um, but the idea of complete improvisation um, is more exciting to me now, you know, and mm -hmm. I mean, like you record it well, I hooked up with this, Another a Russian guitar player, actually not Russian, but Estonia, mm. is a guy I found on YouTube like five or six years ago, like just going through YouTube and he, he came up like playing on street corners all throughout Europe. Mm. And I just fell in love with the guy's playing, you know, it was just so beautiful. And he had big crowds too. And he was like a, you know, interesting character and, um, and and so I, I do this throughout my life. I like with Stomi Amashta, it was like that. You know, I, I heard him in a record store, like playing on metal objects on a wall and stuff like that. And I just, I sought him out hmm. for, for a year, you know, until I found him. Evelyn Glenny, same thing. I, I like found her, you know, and I, I wanted to do something with her on, on this album that I'm working on. I flew down to San Francisco. She came here. I took her to uh, Paul Allen's Experience Music Project with a, a hard hat on before it was open. <laughs> I'm courting her, you know? And, uh, and she's playing with the symphony. And I, we had it all set up to record. And then at the last minute, she canceled that same day, you know? Um, mm -hmm. But I understand. She, was, she said, I'm doing a world premiere of a piece that I've commissioned. And... Um, I, I get it, you know. So, um, what's my point? Um, so this guy, um, eventually, he started getting bigger and he started playing the most beautiful halls in Europe, cathedrals and this and that, and blew up. And he came to the states to do a tour. And we we finally I found him somehow, and we we met like on on Zoom or whatever, uh, you know. And we finally met, and we had. A, and he was came to Seattle and he was playing at the opera house. And um, we met the night before for dinner. And then it, it was arranged that I'd play with him like the second half of a set, but no rehearsal, just sound check, you know? Mm. And it was just beautiful. It was just like, and I knew it was going to be, you know, it wasn't jazz. It was like he plays acoustic guitar and it's like gypsy music, but not straight, you know, not like Gypsy Kings. It's something else. But I just knew that it was going to happen and it just happened like crazy. So then I ended up going to Moscow, St. Petersburg mm -hmm. and touring. And we that's the tour I was supposed to be doing this year. But to me, I, I just I just trust myself more. What I like, I like. You know what I mean? It's like. I'm not going to fight it. I don't care what you say. I mean, this is what brings me pleasure and joy. And so, but to be in a room with four people and just improvise and record it really well. I mean, I, I look, I do look forward to that. Yeah. I mean, I even have, you know, one of my combos that I teach like this semester is the avant-garde combo. So at first, you know, sometimes students will be like, oh, you know, this is, is this really serious music? I mean, you know, and then sure enough, you know, when I had them perform, one, they had a really good chemistry, but all of a sudden they realized that, you know, they, they weren't thinking about like, you know, scales over chords anymore. They weren't thinking about licks anymore, you know, yeah. Yeah. they were all of a sudden playing the moment. Yeah. And, then, and then they're faced with like, 
what they can come up with, you know, and really sh- it's like a mirror. Like, who are you? How deep can you go into yourself when you're playing? And when you're playing with great players, you know, sometimes you go really deep because it's your turn to go there. And then sometimes you kind of pull back a little bit and let other people, it's like a conversation. And so, and sometimes to me, some other styles, I love playing all the styles, obviously, but some other styles are almost like a play where you rehearse, you know, like you're saying the same uh, things, you know, the, the words of a play that are written down and people are kind of repeating them where improv- improvisation, real improv- improvisation, you're making it completely up in, in the moment. And that's yeah. like a whole different thing. You're not, you're not regurgitating a script, you know, that you've rehearsed and it really, it really makes a big difference. And, you know, it's not easy for people to listen to necessarily, you know, because, you know, you're, you're proud of it because you did it. But it does again, you have to put it out there for the people that will appreciate it. And, you know, because yeah, yeah. you, you think about all the music. I mean, why did people come up with the very first music at first? You know, did you read there's a great Ted Joya. He's a great writer. There's a great book called Music, A Subversive History. Read this book because he goes all the way back to like thousands and thousands of years of why music started and like all it's like such an incredible book. And he goes like, think about this. You look at a symphony orchestra. Most of that stuff started out. Those instruments start out as weapons, you know, and you start going, oh, my God, you're right. You know, bows and arrows, sticks, you know, those were things to stay alive. And then people somehow manipulated them into self-expression. And then when it gets together, now all of a sudden you have people agreeing. So like sports, it's always like you're fighting. Who's going to win the game with music? Everybody wins when everybody's together. And I wish in schools, you know, like they would realize that music is so important from that aspect. You're, you're, everybody rises when you're successful in the performance. It's not that one side won and the other side lost. And that's not really taught enough. And you know, our society kind of reflects that people have, have forgotten to think that when everybody's at least living, a, you know, can feed their families and can, you know, has a home and stuff, then everybody's going to win no matter how rich or poor you are. It's it makes, you know, it doesn't it drive you crazy how nonsensical so much stuff is in this planet right now. You know, don't you just want to, like, throw a shoe through your television half the time? You know, yeah. it's unbelievable. It's just unbelievable. I mean, it's unbelievable that, um, you know, the resistance to what is just right and proper and makes sense and is healthy and good for most people. The resistance mm-hmm. to that. There's a great book, uh, another great book. Ted Goya, I, I read his um, Twitter all the time, and mm-hmm. uh, I follow him. And he's yeah, we're friends too, stuff. right? Yeah, yeah, great stuff. I, I comment some every once in a while. Uh, there's a really great book called The War of Art, and it's by a guy named Stephen Pressfield. And he wrote it initially for, like, writers. He's a writer. He writes novels as well. Like he wrote The Legend of ba- uh, Bagger Vance, you know, mm-hmm. um, and he writes these historical like military novels. But he wrote this book to inspire writers and it's become a bestseller for entrepreneurs, musicians, you know, every it, artistic. And it's a short book, it's just a short book, but it's so potent. And he talks about like what you have to do to make any art that you want to do Mm. and he calls he calls it the resistance like the gravity that takes you away from it Mm -hmm. like like or whatever excuse you may have at any given point for not doing the thing that you should be doing on a deep level like with your life like No family member, no wife, no daughter, no son. Nobody gets in the way, you Mm -hmm. know? It's like, that's called the resistance. He he calls it the resistance. It's like gravity. And Mm -hmm. it's just a, a, it's just a, kind of a thrilling book you know <laughs> there's another good book called free play by stefan nakmanovich have you read that book i have not no. that's 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 a, a short paperback book too where he talks and he, and he references you know everything from greek philosophy buddhism you know all the way through jazz musicians and 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 talks about like freeing your mind to be able to actually improvise 
you know, because so, so many people fight that. So you're talking about a resistance. A lot of people have a self-resistance to be able to just let what they already can do, do, you know? Exactly. exactly. That's exactly what it's free play by who? Stefan Nakmanovich. Nakmanovich. Yeah, I, I can't spell the name right offhand. I mean. I, I can. Yeah. You know, being of Russian descent. Just kidding. <laughs> um, wow, guys, this is this is great because this is one of one of my more fun interviews because I'm just listening to, to some you guys are just dropping science. You know, I, I want to interject a couple things. things. Um, first thing, the goal of this show was really to, to go a little differently and to access for, for our audience some ideas about creativity about it. And you guys are just nailing it because what I'm hearing is uh what, what one would expect from, from, from gentlemen with your output, this embracing of how important improvisation is mm -hmm. and trusting, trusting that inner voice, trusting. And when you look back, well, what's so exciting to me, and I, I hope people are picking up on this, is you are burning with this fire mm -hmm. in March of 2021. And you gentlemen, the amount of musicians, not just drummers, but musicians of all types that I know personally, that I read, that I see other people, people I listen to, and they point back to the, the lessons from, from those two bands. And, 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 and uh, you know, the stuff that Santana did and the stuff that that Pat Metheny group, that I think that golden era, you know, I, I mean, uh, uh, the, the styles of music that are, that are in there, jazz, funk, rock, pop melodies, being okay to embrace melodic, but also improvising to have these long jams where again there's no soloing per se it's texture it's this you know pulling in brazilian afro-cuban rock electronics and and i think the lesson i'm hearing here is even when you were starting out as young men you were just saying i'm just ready to do whatever you know just listen and listen to the others around me and it's such a great lesson because you here you are, you know, as mature gentlemen who've done it all kind of not really, you're still doing it, but, but you, you realize, and you're sharing with us that that was the point all along. Well, I think, you know, what, like what Mike just said about resistance, you know, I, for me, I've been so fortunate to have associated with people that let me be me, you know, for, so for instance, like I have a book called, you know, turn the beat around where I, it's all about playing one and three, on the snare drum instead of two and four. It's the only book written like that. So I dedicated that to my high school band director, Donald Ehrensberger, because he let me do whatever I wanted in the high school band. I mean, when we auditioned, I was in the chemistry, I was in the sports. He wanted me to audition for the band, right? And I go, I didn't, didn't look at any of the stuff. So I came in eighth out of, you know, eight people. And the, and the school band had five chairs. He expanded it to eight chairs. And before I know it, I was the lead. So he would let me improvise on symphonies and say, I like what you're doing more than what's written. And then like the people with earwax control, Jeff Check and Gordon James, who were still friends, when we would, when we would talk, you know, we would play and we, we would just go into like a park in the middle of the night, just with a cowbell and a woodblock and just listen to the sounds and just, you know, so, and throughout my whole life, my wife, for instance, I mean, she let me be me, you know, where I could have stayed in Chicago in the early days and done sessions and weddings and made a lot more money. She let me go on the road to play creative music because she said, that's what you need to do. So in so many ways, I feel so blessed in that my entire life, I've been around people that have let me be me. And that's, that's really, not everyone is that fortunate or like, you know, there's so many forks in the road that all you'd have to do is take the one that all of a sudden you're, you're at a dead end, you know? And yeah, so, yeah. you know, and Mike, you have probably the same thing. I mean, you were around creative people that let you, you know, producing like that, the, the record welcome. I love, that's one of my favorite records, you know? I mean, you, 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 so you're not only a drummer and percussionist, but you expanded who you are. I produce a lot too, you know? So we just expand and expand and people just let us do that we're so fortunate yeah i mean i i, I was very conscious of of some things like in, in observing other people i knew musicians i knew there's a reason why i didn't get married until i was in my 30s you know i mean me that too was a, that was me a choice too. because i saw musician friends of mine get married and then it's all over you know it's like 
And I thought, you know, nothing against it. God bless him. You know, you find love, whatever. But I don't want, I didn't want anything to get in the way or anybody to get in the way, nor did I do. I want to have to have that kind of conflict with a person. And, you know, I just, so my, my thinking about that, and this is a little bit harsh, um, is that when people say, well, you know, I really wanted to do this, or I really wanted to do that, but, you know, you know, I had my responsibilities and this, and I didn't, you know, like, like I needed to be, you know, stand up and be a man and this and this. And I'm like, you know, I tell you what, it's like this, either you wanted it so much, you had to do it or you didn't period. You know, there's no excuses. You either do it or you don't. And it sounds a little harsh, but that's the reality. I mean, because, you know, it's, I mean, we, like I had success really young. And so after that, I've never matched that success, you know, and everybody always like goes back to that for me. And so all the other stuff I've done, it's like, you know, it's not an easy path, even though you have success, you know, at, at a certain age or about certain things, it's not an easy path. And, and people take, take for granted that it is, you know, because, oh, you know, people know you and you're famous or you're this and that. It's like, that won't get you on the bus, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it won't pay the rent or it won't pay the mortgage or, or anything like that. But um, so it's a constant kind of, not struggle, but, you know, you got to really want it. You got to really want it. And for me, it's not like, oh, I really want it. It's just like, I don't really have a choice, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I really enjoy it. And so uh, there's a lot of ways I feel very selfish to, still to this day. Like, <laughs> I mean, I'm out in my studio and I know it's time to go in for dinner, but I could stay out another three or four hours, like just, just piddling around like an old man, like whether I'm working on some software or, or I've got a pile of old DAT tapes that I'm going through, like you were talking about and realizing I've got outtakes from, this record, you know, with uh, David Torn and Andy Summers, I got whole outtakes of stuff. I could put this stuff out, you know? Well, it's so funny you should mention that because, I mean, my <laughs> wife, I mean, my wife's a brilliant musician. She was in the Secret Story Band, but we've been together for, you know, for God, you know, almost 40 years. But the thing bar, is, right? he, that's Barb, right. Thank you. Yeah. And so one of the things I, you, you were talking about going in your room and getting lost when the internet just came out. I remember watching television. I started saying WWW. And finally, what is this thing? So I went to a cop USA. I said, what is this thing? And <laughs> they said, well, you know, it's this internet. You need this Netscape navigator and stuff. And I was teaching at Northwestern at the time. So I had BB at it. I had some free programs. So right. I buried myself and taught myself to, you know, get online. Now you, I think were one of the first drummers, if not the first drummer, if I remember to get on, on use the internet. And I think I was like one of the first 10 or something to actually have a website you remember that yeah I mean, you were, I you were really early before and that that opened up doors too so it's not just the music but it, you want your music to get out there so you find ways that are creative so you expand your creativity by being creative outside of just sitting there in a drum set man i'm, I'm at that point now where i realize i've got to take it to another level if i really want you know i mean i've got to invest some money in um it doesn't have to be a lot of money but i need like cameras i need lighting i need if you want to put yourself out there during this pandemic you know like a lot of people are doing it and i i should be taking more advantage of it you know um because i i tell you the truth i mean this is a terrible thing to say like being in this pandemic it's like hasn't been so bad for me same here I, I mean, know. you almost feel guilty, right? Oh, it's yeah. Like, I do this anyway, you know? That's it's right. like, whoops, I'm kind of fine without people, you know? <laughs> well, you know oh, man, me too. Because, I I mean, when it was really bad, I mean, I would just sit in the house and I'd feel totally fine. After all those years of touring, I was totally cool just staying in my house. <laughs> and then, you know, you set up your personal space. I mean, now I'm working on all these other projects 
projects. But when I first got this studio together, um, I had somebody come and help me set everything up, like all my electronics, all this. So everything was going into, everything was set up to record everything. And so I would just get things going and improvise and just, and then, I mean, I'm listening back to that stuff from a couple of years ago. And I'm going, okay, I got to get back to that, except I've got, you know, two books I'm working on and I got this. <laughs> but, but what's fun to do is just get all those things going, like with some loops and the electronic stuff and this and improvise and then go back and edit it, you know, just edit it, pick the good stuff. And this is what a lot of the, uh, the DJs do. I, I, I watch some of their classes on Masterclass, you know. They just like, they just go. They've got, you know, big boards and they have everything set up and they go and then they just pick the best stuff. Um, it's like a Tio Macero thing, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what I love most is just going and doing what you love and then finding the good bits and become good at editing you know? Yeah. And those kind of skills, that's why I'm trying to learn those skills. The better I can learn like a DAW and, and the use of it, the more, the more output I'm going to have, frankly. I, I love it. I, I'm going to jump in. This is again. I'm, Sorry, I'm, man. I, I, you can't shut me up once I start. <laughs> Sorry. No, this is one of the, this is one of the greatest uh, conversations I've been involved in because the joy and the naturalness of of the communication is, is beautiful. I'm learning so much. I want to back up and mention a couple of things you both said. First of all, um, you mentioned Evelyn Glennie. Wow, one of my favorites. And folks, anyone who does not know this woman and her music, I put a link in the chat. Check out Evelyn Glennie, amazing percussionist. Also, you both said some two incredible quotes. Michael, you said there's a responsibility that you have as players to play what, what inspires you. Uh, I, I think I garbled that, but the responsibility part I thought was beautiful because you're both teachers and there is a responsibility to, to, to be honest. And mm -hmm. I think you're talking a little bit, so that was a great quote. And then Paul, you said, there's a thing called chemistry. Mm. Wow. And that, that's again, it's that's true. It's really true. Yeah. That's it. You know, so, so I wanted to point back to those. I wanted to, to uh, also ask you both to, to talk a little bit about another area, because I think one of the interesting things too, as, as players, as musicians, as I said before, you, there, there's not a style that you, you, you didn't integrate and, and be part of along the way, but also gear wise, I think it's great that you both dabbled in world percussion, all kinds of different instruments, but, but electronics, which a lot of people draw that line. So I want you to talk about that a little bit because, um, Michael, of course, uh, uh, you, you did some, some, you were involved, you had a company you were involved with in the early 70s. Tell people a little bit about that. And also just for some context, people need to realize that you've got the records like Transfer Station Blue and these records with Klaus Schultz and the Stoma Yamash to go. And even up to your recent stuff with Spellbinder, there's electronics for 50 years in your career. And likewise, when we, Paul, answer this too, in the Pat Metheny group and in your own stuff, using trigger pads, using loops. Especially with been, earwax control, for yeah, sure. Always been naturally integrated. So I want you both to talk about your relationship with that and what, if anything, you're listening to today in electronics. So talk to me about that. <laughs> Go ahead, Paul. Well, you know, again, you know, just being around creative people and, and being able to just, you know, just have fun. Earwax control I remember taking a cassette. Now, remember in the old days, you had to cut tapes up, Mike, you know? So yeah. I remember taping Bella Lugosi, Lawrence Welk, and having them, their voices, so they actually introduced earwax control on stage when I played that cassette that was all taped. Oh, and, wow. you know, and if you listen to our second recording, which is called Number Two Live, you know, it's live to a two-track stereo mic to inaugural recording, no PA system. And it's three people. And when I hear it, I can't, it sounds like 10 people. I can't figure out how we did this. I had Barkus Berry pickups and all this stuff going through all, uh -huh. I was just manipulating everything. And then again, I used a lot of metallic. I, I still have like a cookie sheet that I used to use way before it became popular. So I was into metallic 
uh, textures. And then if I did, you know, I had a, uh, I have like two um, electro harmonics memory men and then two ring modulators. And I put my percussion through all that stuff. And then when, especially when you did it analog, you know, you could never get the same thing again, you know, which yeah. was so fun because with digital, it's great, but digital, you press, oh, okay, this is the setting. Boom. I know what I'm going to get with analog. If you look at like, uh, the Matheny, there's uh, live in uh, Japan, 1995. That's the only drum saw I ever had on a, rec a record. I've got these cowbells, these Pete Engelhardt cowbells, and I've yeah. got triggers on it. And I'm wrestling with my left hand, getting feedback and stuff. And it's like wrestling a tiger and trying to play a drum solo at the same time. And it was all, always fun because you never knew what was going to happen. And that was part of the thing with electronics. People got really scared and they think, well, you know, electronics, Electronics, you know, all that, you know, it's got to be acoustic. Well, acoustic stuff is great, too. But realize that the saxophone wasn't accepted at first, too. A lot of a lot of acoustic instruments weren't accepted at first, too. And so if you were open to the new things, because Mike and I were also coming out of rock as well as jazz and ethnic music, we were able to just accept things. It was just a sound. Everything is just a sound. You've got 12 notes to a, a, to an octave, right? You know, what is the difference? Well, it's the timbre of the sound that makes a difference. Does it get, is it a guitar G? Is it, an, you know, is a saxophone G? It's like, and, and you realize that sounds are, are just sounds. And, and with electronics, it, it gave you a lot of new ways to be able to make new sounds. And it was just, it, and then it would inspire you to play differently, you know, and, and you would basically be playing off the sound. And before you knew it, you were playing things you would never have thought about. And that's the beauty of that. And so even with a word of cocaine and grace, some people we did a, a thing one time where we did a master class talking about uh, what is this thing called jazz that I came up with. And there were a couple people in the audience. Well, you guys aren't playing jazz. I mean, cause David Kane's playing like a, an iPad and he's playing a rolly, you know, and people are going, well, that's not jazz. And it's like, are you kidding me? So, you know, we have to realize that so many people are hard, you know, things are slow to change and, us as artists and just as who we are as people, we have to do what we believe and change is a big part. And just loving the unexpected as opposed to getting stuck in the comfortable. That's, that's why we're different. Mike. Yeah. I mean, I completely agree. It, it's kind of like, um, I've always been attracted by, uh, I've always been attracted to slightly left of center stuff. You know, I mean, even when I was, well, not left of center, but I remember the first time, like I, when I was I was playing drums, I was playing like in school bands, and I was playing in, I I loved the rudiment stuff, you know, and I would I would all that, and I would play in bands that would play all kinds of different things, um, and I remember hearing for the first time Charles Lloyd's um, Forest Flower, mm. you know. And that just like Jack's playing on that and the whole thing, like there was something about the sensibilities and the touch and the dynamics that I realized, oh my God. I mean, I was I had been into Elvin and stuff, but something about that record, like really, like I related to the lightness, you know? And I never considered myself a, a, a rock and roll drummer, even though Santana's considered rock and roll, but I realized after doing this uh, reunion we did a few years ago that like I could never play with this because it's so loud, you know, <laughs> it's, it's so loud between like uh, Carlos and Neil Sean. Um, it's like I could never play like I used to play and Carlos would just want a backbeat, you know, or sometimes say take it out. But I would always pl I always played light, you know. Um, and in regard to sound, yeah, 1973, I met these people uh, from Portland, Oregon, who were making these uh, electronic drums called Impact. Mm. And um, I used them um, with Automatic Man in 1976 on the album. I, you know, some, some real different sounds. Um, I mean, Bill Bruford used to come down all the time and, mm. like, check out my rig, you know. <laughs> and... Um, but yeah, I mean, stuff like pursuing people like Stomia Mashtar and those, I, 
I, I mean, even to this day, I mean, what I look for, I look for music, as far as electronics, a lot, everybody's doing, every, every drummer coming up now, um, like to me, like, and I, using this sensory percussion thing, I don't know if you've heard that, but mm -hmm. that's a, a real powerful instrument. So, and uh, a lot of the jazz guys are, are using that in a really creative way like um uh like who's doing that like um marcus gilmore and um there's another guy that's doing it that's really unbelievable kind of ai software um that has possibilities i mean uh you know i could show you a picture of my setup here and it's like the, it's both acoustic and electronics the trick is also now try to put it all together you know to like like, uh, do I really want that Tom Tom there? You know, maybe I can put like a whole pad that can do, I can have 10, 10 zones on the drum, you know, and play different things and stuff like that. But I mean, even now what I look for, um, like I just started buying digital art <laughs> mm. and it's not expensive, but the, but you know, it's, I'm a big fan of computer art. I used to go out, Paul, to the, uh, University of uh, Illinois, and uh, is it Champaign or what's mm -hmm. it called? Yeah, Champaign. It's where I mean, my daughter went. Oh, okay. Well, in the 70s or 80s, I used to fly out there to meet these professors who were computer professors, but they were one of the, the early people doing computer art at mm. the very beginning of computers. So I've always been interested in graphic arts and computer art and wanting to incorporate it. I mean, now it's unbelievable. I don't know if you've seen like Amon Tobin or are familiar with this guy, Amon Tobin, but oh my God, um, he doesn't even play an instrument. Now he does. Now he does all the modular stuff, but before he just used to sample hmm. and he would sample the coolest, like, you know, from Max Roach to this, to that, and, and make other kind of music out of it. You, and um, just by manipulating, but he, he's gone to this level where a few years back he did this tour with these graphics and stuff that were so, th this gets me. I mean, now what's going on now with, uh, with digital arts, <coughs> excuse me, and immersive arts, I'm seeing it more and more. That's where I want to put my music is in because that's where it's going, like with the goggles and everything mm -hmm. else. And you know, like surround and immersive. I love the, the fact of you may see this Van Gogh thing touring, like three uh, D Van Gogh, where it's mm -hmm. completely immersive on the walls. And um, well, what our last uh, well, word of cocaine gray? It's three sixty. We filmed in three sixty in the studio, so you can go around and you can just watch anything. You know, oh, very nice. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. It just opens up so so many possibilities. You know, yeah. and you were talking about Elvin earlier. Elvin had that thing where he saw colors. Remember, if you watch yeah. that the different drummer documentary, you know that yeah. film where he's going. This is a yellow one here, and this is an orange That's here. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's synesthesia. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. I mean, I mean, the marriage of that is happening a lot now. And so I'm finding myself being attracted to that and wanting to hook up with visual artists. I mean, I would, you know, I actually toy with learning it myself, but I got to, I got to learn the music software more, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, and the software that's with uh, sensory percussion, it's all software based. So, and I'm slow. I'm just on that other side of the DNA where it's <laughs> a little bit still reptilian, you know? So <laughs> I have to work, that much harder but i'm but i'm stubborn and um uh, but so this digital art there's a, a, a website called sedition art and um visual artists digital artists put the stuff up but the stuff moves it's not mm -hmm. static mm -hmm. and so i mean it's as subtle as like a room with the background of sky and clouds with sheer curtains and they just ever so slightly move. And in the background, the clouds are passing and there's a candle that flickers, you know? And and I've got, and so, you know, for not too much money, like I'm talking like 80 bucks or something, yeah. 
you can buy these different pieces of art that there's only like two or 300 of them mm. and you can't take it out of the app. So you can't like, I can't show you. Yeah. I can't post it online. Yeah. Right. Got it. Yeah. I mean, it's a little bit like what's happening now with the, you know, the, uh, what is it called? NTFs, you know, right. um, but, um, yeah. but I found that, what I do is I put my music to these pieces mm -hmm. and I'm like, Oh my God, this is perfect. And so I, now I want to get in touch with the artists and say, would you consider, you know, like try this music to your piece rather than what you put to it, you know? Right. Right. And some of it like, and I'm thinking, man, I could do that. Cause I'm not a composer. Like I don't really know, you know, stuff but I know what I like and I still, I like to create environments. I mean, even on my, this record, I'm talking about drums of compassion. I mean, I've got, I've got rain, you know, I've got one of the songs is made up of a rhythm from the women doing laundry in the jungle and the, mm. um, you know, you know, and I, I cut it. So it's the rhythm and I'm, I'm really in, in, I'm really trying to like make myself make different kind of records now, like really environmental. Like I spent an hour yesterday going through sound effects, like walking in the forest or rain or fires. And like, I want to put that in my, in my sonic presentations, you know? Well, man, we have to do some stuff together. Cause we're, it really sounds like we're on some parallel plateaus here you know because yeah. that's with word of cocaine gray that's what we do too we put a lot of stuff to to um you know like we, we watch things or we'll put things after to go with the music i mean there's that correlation that opens up new possibilities so you're not again you know you're getting away from just the theory and the rules you know the quote-unquote rules and you're opening up to new things and especially you know people nowadays in the old days we were talking about listening to records but now you know people are used to seeing stuff and hearing stuff you know everybody's moving faster you know it's just it's it's like a different world and and we don't want to we don't want to get left behind but i don't think we will because we love this new stuff and we're yeah. accepting it and i was going to say one more thing it's okay i think sometimes if we're not fast on the new technology that means that you just get someone that is fast but let give them your ideas so they can do it. You know, it's like I, if you I, I, if you yeah. if you're a two finger typer, you know, it's gonna it gets tired to try to get your ideas out. So if you tell it to somebody and they just go like that, then your ideas don't get lost. And there's a thing about getting lost because we're going well. This is too much. Oh, I got to read the manual, and all. And by the time you read the manual, there's a new new version that came out that's changed everything. So I think it's really important that we don't get stuck. And, and just, you know, live the moment and find ways that allows us to live that moment. And that's why that's why we have engineers and that's why we have technicians to do yeah. things to to let us be us. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, like I've got to I've, I've, I've got to um, <clears throat> I've got to I want to learn it because I want to be self-sufficient. You know, I don't I'm so tired of like having to say I got to call somebody and have, pay them to come over and do this for me or that for me but you're but you're right you know it's like don't waste time doing stuff that you're not good at do what you're good at mm -hmm. you know and then you know learn stuff but don't make it stop your creativity or the flow and you also will inspire them you know because i've talked to you know engineers that in the old days like you know like Reinhold Mack, who I did a, a, an album in, in Poland, he did, you know, Rolling Stones and, and uh, you know, Electric Light Orchestra and Queen. He said in the old days, you know, in Germany, you would have to wear a white coat and like, yeah. you know, you would have distortion. So, you know, there were rules that were being broken. And so for us, we might tell a technician that might not even think that way. They might be good at doing something. And we're saying, well, do this. And they go, well, that's not possible. Well, no, we're, we're going to do it. And before you know it, they've come up with something new, too. So you're inspiring them to find things that they didn't even know about, which yeah. is what art is supposed to do. You know, break the rules and and inspire people. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love it. What, what a great, uh, uh, you know, <clears throat> discourse on, on where we are in electronics and modern uh, tools. Yet that balance. Uh, what a beautiful way of looking at it, of like, you know what? 
if, if it's an area you can't do, you get someone in while still pushing to learn and, and to keep uh, gathering new info. Man, you know, uh, so good. Uh, we, we, we're going to wrap up in just a couple of minutes here, folks. I wanted to uh, hit a couple of the areas and just say, um, well, first off, thanks to these two gentlemen. W what a masterclass this has been. And I think I speak for the audience when I say, yes, guys, please collaborate on something. Get, you know, let, let's, let's get, you know, let's have the, 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 yeah. <laughs> the Wordico Shreve, Shreve Wordico drum. Wordico, let's keep it alphabetical. Yeah. <laughs> Both of it. We'll, we'll figure something out. <laughs> While we're talking, I reached over to, by the way, Michael, uh, uh, sitting right here, I've got a scene. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. And I, I swear, I didn't, I didn't plan this. I just, it's just arm's length and a blank cassette. Because I still, this is a pretty shitty one, but I still use cassettes. And I, you're right, man. The, the good ones, the Maxell, XLs, sound great. I mean, this, yeah, this is not. I mean, I, I've got. I'm going through all these old cassettes. <laughs> old <laughs> dats, like I got dats here. I've got a dat machine I borrowed from a studio owner who never used. Here we go. It. Oh gosh. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And it, I got my um, like. Like these are all, these are all DVDRs of Elvin, you know, of interviews and and stuff like that. Oh, we can't wait for for that book. Yeah, before before I forget, Mike, you know, I had a student at one time. He, he would come up from Arkansas, and the first lesson he goes, "Can I tape this lesson?" And I said, "Sure," you know. And he goes, "Oh, by the way, you know, I've got all these recordings of of me studying with like Elvin Jones, Andrew Surreal, Bob Moses from 1976. Wow. So I've got like two or three or four Elvin Jones lessons with him. Oh my God, that are incredible." They're amazing. Oh, I'd love to hear that. Yeah, we, we're going to, I'll have to have to share this with you because, you know, at one point, Elvin's talking about movies and, and he'll go like, well, you know, cowboy you might be, movies. You, cowboy yeah, movies. Yeah, but check, no, check this out. So, so Elvin at one point goes, well, you know, you might be wondering, you're, you're paying for a drum lesson, but, you know, you, I'm talking about movies, but when you study with me, you're getting me, which makes sense, you know? And and there was so much cool stuff on there. So yeah, we'll hook up on that too. Can you, can you have you digitized it? Yeah, it's uh, it's he he made CDs of this stuff. Oh, I see. Wow. wow. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> wow, that's really something. <laughs> that's They're amazing, man. I'm telling you, there's all of them are amazing. But you know, the Elvin ones. Yeah, they're really, really. I mean, it's just fascinating to hear. I felt like I was taking a lesson with Elvin. You know. It, it really was it was really incredible well well um no oh my god you know we should do this every thursday because there's, there you go so much it's awesome you know we're all over the map here on cultural stuff a couple things i'm rolling back that you mentioned too that were great uh, first off uh, uh elvin was in that movie zachariah i think it was called 1971 and you know that's not him playing on the soundtrack do you know that it's dubbed, it's dubbed huh it's dubbed because they didn't get the sound so earl palmer they asked Earl Palmer to do it. And, and he said, I can't play like Elvin. And they said, oh, come on. So he went and he transcribed the thing and then he played it. And it's really good. I mean, so that's Earl Palmer, the drummer, you know, from, I, you know, the great studio drummer from, you know, everything, really. And, and he's the one that did it because they, they couldn't get Elvin's sound down. Fantastic. Well, people, you know, fun movie, but Elvin Jones in a movie. And, and, and it's a Western movie in the 1800s, and he plays a sheriff, I think. Yeah. Also, uh, you brought up synesthesia before, which a few people were mentioning. And that, that's the thing where you, you smell color and you hear sound. You hear... Uh, um, See colors when you play, you hear. Yeah, and, and, and actually, Andy Summers had a record with that name. So there's a, a connectivity there. You know, a, a lot of love from the people in the chat. I just want to pass on a lot of hellos, a lot of people just uh very excited that you're both doing new music excited to know that the uh and it's paulwertico.com michaelstreep.com i love when it's easy folks go to those websites um a lot of info a lot of bios a lot of new music coming up um as as michael said you know he's got this uh um drums of compassion coming up which sounds fantastic paul has got trio records uh, in in the hopper as well so so 
keep this circle going, folks watching. These are gentlemen that are still creating, and and that's important. You know, it, it, the history's great, but uh, you know, uh, but again, a couple of great people. And and here's a shout out to you, Paul. Uh, your old monitor guy, Jody McAllister, is on. Oh my God, Jody, how you doing? Wow. Jody's there, and uh, a lot a lot of great people. Uh, hey, Farco, and hey, Sharon's here. Willie, oh, just a lot of great uh, uh, fans who are so happy. People, someone bought one of those books already that you recommended. The uh, <laughs> which the, one? You got some links up there. Uh, which, which book did did someone buy there? Well, I put the links up for both of those books. Uh, I'm, oh, well, good for you. I lost the quote, but free play, and then the other okay. one. Okay. But um, you know, uh, uh, it's it's what a, what an exciting bunch of people who are now going to spread the word and and uh, um, share this chat. And we got the. I, I also wanted to add, uh, Andre, that my Facebook page. Well, it's really nice. It's really static. Okay. And um, so my activity is really now currently on Instagram at Michael Shreve and um, on Facebook, both at Michael Shreve and Michael Shreve Music, which is brand new. Okay. So um, I'm, I've, I've started posting a lot, trying to get better at it uh, on um, Instagram. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm good at Facebook, but yeah. You well, it takes a lot of time to be doing all that stuff. You know, that's the one thing. It's like the self-promotion thing. It's interesting, but it's also like you could be practicing or reading or teaching instead of like putting up stuff that, you know, disappears so quickly too. So, yeah, you know, it, it's, it's, know. De it's definitely a give and take as far as that's concerned. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's a dilemma. And, and okay, great. I just followed Michael Street. And, and Paul, are you on Instagram too? Or? Yeah, he is. I am. Yeah, I'm on Instagram, but I, I do a lot of Facebook. I have a couple Facebook things, you know, so. My, and uh, so, yeah, the Instagram looks great. Followed by Crystal Beth Boom. Beth Fleener, who was on the show. A couple oh. of the show. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You had her on? Yeah, yeah. You know Beth, right? Yeah. yeah she's wow, wonderful, amazing artist. But she was on about, about two months ago with, with Julie Slick. So, um, good good company here so folks follow those threads spread the word and and uh i'm gonna watch this one again i don't often get to but there's so many amazing things and, and i'd like yeah, to me too, me too. Yeah, i'd like to invite you gentlemen let's do this again down the road in a couple months because absolutely we, especially when you have these new records out and we can you know uh, uh talk about that um you know we're, we're gonna we have to wrap up sadly but uh, i just want to thank you both uh stay safe keep on uh, creating as you do. Um, I, in, in closing comments, I always uh, sometimes forget to mention to people a few things coming up uh, on Wednesday. Uh, it's my other show called the gear spotlight, which is complete, just geek gear and equipment. And I want to invite you gentlemen to do that one where we just talk about gear, drum sets, mm -hmm. triggers, kick pedals. We just go all the way for the nerds. So let's do that. But coming up this week, uh, everyone will enjoy this, but I think you gentlemen will, especially a young drummer named Merlin Ettore, and he's probably 30 years old, and he's uh, Yamaha and Dorsey, lives in Berlin, and he's just an incredible drummer who integrates with modular synthesis. Mm -hmm. So his rig is him with his modular right next to him, and he sets up these beats, and he does this. And, and what's beautiful is he's got the rudiments. He's like, you know, seriously working on the the the... the the techniques you need to, but also very good at that electronic world. So again, it's that, it's that hybrid of stuff. So that's this Wednesday coming up, March 31st, next week, Merlin Atore. And then on April 9th on this show, uh, Confronting Creativity, the one and only Alex Skolnick from Testament and the Alex Skolnick Trio and so many other groups. So we got a bunch of stuff coming up. Folks, subscribe here at Make Weird Music. Sub subscribe, like, let your friends know about it. We're here to keep pushing the envelope on music that breaks boundaries, that asks questions. And these gentlemen here, again, can't thank them enough for blazing that trail for, for in the groups they've been in and on their own. And what we love is they're going to keep doing it and we're going to keep uh, bringing them to you guys. So, All guys. Right. so I got to get, uh, Andre, would you send our emails to each other? I will. I absolutely will. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Andre. Paul, so great to see you. You too, oh, Michael. Thanks. Thank thanks you, Andre. See you yeah. soon. Keep in touch. Bye. All right.